So um, well, we've got this website, Understanding Uncertainty, which has got all the stuff on, you know, blogs and things like that. And um, we, uh, there's me on YouTube taking my clothes off. There's two of me taking my clothes off. That's a risk. And you can see the reflection. So I can wake you up. I can mean, go to school stuff if you want to school work. And, and in fact, I've been advising on the uh, UGCS math syllabus, which I don't know if you've seen. There's a split probability of statistics, a lot more probability than one of the UGCS math syllabus. It's a great thing. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, I also do that for the students. Do people recognize this? Who recognizes that? Great. <laughs> you poor people, people who don't. <laughs> you do, you're just not up with culture. This is the wipeout course. This is in Argentina, Buenos Aires. And um, you go to this, jump over the big balls, pour them in the water, and try to win 10,000 people, which is what I did. Um, and if you were a school's audience, I'd show you the bill of me doing it. But you're not so tough. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
which is a one in a million chance of death. And I wish I'd invented this. I wonder how the Stanford invented this. Published by 1970. One in a million chance of death. It's a really useful unit because it enables you to where almost anything you do can be expressed. There's a whole number of micro So it's equivalent to living and coming 20 times and it can be hits every time. It's one in a million chance. It's quite a good way. Oh, so, so, okay, let's look at the experiment. Um, okay, I did flip a coin 20 times. It's a fair coin. I do carry too many coins. So, 20 times, it comes up heads every time, the gas jets will open and you will all have a peaceful day. <laughs> so, it's a good game. And um, <laughs> what do I have to pay you to play this? goes to the willingness to pay on you. What do I have to pay you to play this game? Who would do it for a thousand quid? Yes, of course you would. Make it be your life. So of course, who do it for quid? Who do it for one pound seven? Because that's what the Department of Transport would do. The value of a statistical life is one million seven hundred thousand pounds for the Department of Transport. And it's to reduce risk by one of the million a week for one pound seven. So the official figure is one pound seven. It's a bit more expensive. So, um, but you know, we compare what we do. 250 miles, it's actually more than part. This is a euro, about 300 miles of a car now for a micro walk. On average, 20 miles, yeah, 20 miles cycling, it's like less walking, 50 miles, 6 miles. Is that 6? Yeah, 6 miles on a motorbike. I can't do that, 7 now. 4 miles in the US, it's less. 4, four miles on a motorbike. So, in Naples, I say, so jumping out of that plane at 7, that's about 40 miles a motorbike. And then we're going to get a picture. But you can compare it with other things. In fact, what's quite nice is it used to be, it's about 50 million people, give or take, in England and Wales. 50 a day die of non natural causes. It's, it's 50, there's 17,000 deaths or accidents and violence every day. Every year. It's not quite that bad. Um, every year in the UK, it's just the end of the universe. So 50, so our average is one in a million. So you lot, you a miserable lot, we're willing to pay a thousand quid for that debt. But in fact, that's what you're being exposed to every day. More if you're an old fool like me wobbling on ladders doing DIY, <laughs> and more if you're a young kid being on fire or driving this car. But it's an average of one micro a day, our daily dose, which we're happy with. We don't just be careful with it. Maybe you do. You know, you should, of course, be brave enough to try it today. So one micro. So um, it's perhaps a good unit. So you can see the jumping out of the planes, that's seven days a week's worth of normal risk. That's um, so, getting out of bed and going to work, about one, this is like, I see, very risk of that, and this is quite interesting, though. the lifetime of <laughs> an asteroid, one microwave, the National Academy of Sciences report, um, in the US says it's about one in 77 million risk per year of any of us being killed due to an asteroid. <laughs> the point is, it, and, and <laughs> it's, well, it's wonderful, they work out the average number of people killed per year, the expected number is 91. Now, nobody's ever been killed by asteroids. <laughs> 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 it's ridiculous averages. It's an enormous level of zero. And then one in ten thousand, one in ten million years, is going to wipe us out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so 91 is the most, it's like, you know, average number of lakes is what we've known. It's a completely pointless error. It basically means one in 70, um, uh, one in 77 million is about one micro uh, per life. Uh, actually, just that means so every 70 million years we expect the civilization extinguishing asteroid, and the last one was 70 million years ago. So, <laughs> so watch out. Anyway, there's, I've just put some other things up there. Um, we're getting birth, so in Afghanistan. Um, yeah, the peak risk period in, in, in Iraq. That was very, very high risk time. Um, US uh, casualties in Iraq in 2009 was uh, 17 a day, average, but they had a good <laughs> So that's average over everybody served. So that's about 47 is a, 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 a daily risk of heroin, which only takes heroin. Well, that's about that time in 2009 in Afghanistan, which is 9,000 risk personnel, average over everybody on front and top of this, people going out of control. It's equivalent to like everybody, all those 9,000 people, going on a 200 mile, 250 mile drive on a motorbike every single year. But of course, nothing to compare with going over the top of the song or doing it. So this it enables us to compare these things in a way which, and of course, it enables you to make all these sort of comparisons that people don't like making. And for example, David Nutt, if you remember, got into trouble with comparing the risks of horse riding, which we reckon is about 
one micro mortgage that we took together the course of the day. And we've taken, no, we've been taking ecstasy, which we reckon is about one or two micro mortgages a tablet, with going horse riding, the addiction to horse riding, which is called ecstasy. So he was really <laughs> And they are all in the same. I think ecstasy is slightly more dangerous, but eventually, of course, we want more than that. So um, he got into real trouble for that because he was comparing the the, um, the wholesome with the animals. But I think they're really valid comparisons. They're activities taken by young people for fun, voluntarily. So in terms of the natural way in which people distinguish risks, you know, the voluntary against the non-voluntary, and um, uh, whether they um, create the economic post policy, you know, we choose to do them, and whether they're part of the job, whether they're part of leisure. Uh, they're all the same. It's just that it, the culture, this is culturally unacceptable comparison. But this encourages you to make those sorts of things. Okay, what about this kind of risk? <laughs> this is the other kind of risk. Those are all very well for the things that are going to kill you on the spot. And if you survive, you'll be fine. And this is, is, is the sort of, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, the way, the risks of these is not appropriate to use micro Because frankly, Unless you choke on your spam fritter, you don't need to get so rapid. <coughs> Possibly because you've got a food poisoning problem. It's not going to be an acute risk, it's a chronic risk. It's things that affect our health, and if we have a, a lifetime habit of this kind of stuff, we will probably die. So, where the risk is a different type of risk, it's the longer term, not an immediate risk. And so, I think what we're developing, developing is a different unit. Maybe that's the other risk. That's the thing that I like to explore. You can think of sort of that risk. Now, that's the careless pork. Headline from the sun and the danger of the sausage. They come with the sausage. And when I do this at schools, I would venture I've got a sausage. I've had the sausage already. The lethal sausage. Because there, there is a, a media obsession with dangers of a fried breakfast. And for you know, some reason, it's, it's not great with a fried, big fried breakfast every day. But this is a kind of typical story. Um, daily fried foods and sandwiches. This says the daily baked sandwich, 50, 50 grams of processed meat. Daily baked sandwich increases your chance of having that cancer by the And um, let's believe that study. Nutritional epidemiology is not <coughs> the greatest science of that Let's believe it for a moment. Now, pancreatic cancer is a vastly horrible cancer. Uh, fortunately, though, it's quite rare. And quite an AC lifetime risk. There must be two, two people in this room who are going to get cancer. Very nice cancer. But how that 20% increase from that is quite a tricky thing to explain. We're going to do how do we expect a 20% increase from the wine and eighty risk? Okay, so we use lots of different languages there. We're using a simple change, we're using wine and eighty odds way of expressing it. It's shown by psychologists as Gurkhrain, Gurkhrain, or others, that this kind of language is really bad for you. People cannot do these manipulations. It's confusing, really difficult to grasp. I find it very difficult to do those sums in your head. What is that? What's that mean? So the way in which um, Gidrens and others have been pushing it is to use natural treatments. You use try to convert everything to whole numbers. What we expect to happen among a hundred people. And it looks like we've got that in the GCSE medicine. It's now in the way to teach that is very much better than expected numbers among a group of people. It's just a metaphor on the whole thing. Very effective. So what we'd say then is that there's four, and how I would work on this is to say there's 400 people who, like I'm sure, like you want, smoke middle class lot, sit down and feel a nice, worthy breakfast of muesli and the right food, that sort of thing. And, but unfortunately, still, out of those 400, five, when an 80 will get angry. Now, let's compare with 400 complete slobs every morning, eat a bacon sandwich or a breakfast, a grill, from every day, every day of their lives, that so many will get angry. Do you notice the difference? <coughs> One in four hundred. It's the change in number of uh, in, in risk. When, if, when you, if this was the drug, you would say the number needs to treat is four hundred in order to get one extra one extra case. In this case, it's the number that needs to eat. So of people need to eat that every day. Of the life. Of course, actually, if you do eat that every day of your life, you won't live long enough again. <laughs> <laughs> this won't be that. Something else will get you. <laughs> so this is really interesting. But uh, it's been shown in psychological research that communicating to the military risk is an inflated idea of the importance of this. And of course, you say to do that all the time. So it's so stupid. Everybody does it. Everybody does it. And you can see, you can do like a, there's a WHO did a report on Fukushima health risks 
Sorry, you know, the American press, bless them, did it very reportedly absolute risks. Low health risks from the Fukushima accident. I mean, the Wall Street Journal <coughs> tiny cancelled this stuff. Have you seen remember the English newspapers? They tiny cancelled it. The Daily Mail yeah. saying that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it was the Guardian that messed it up. Went for the one big relative risk that the kind of whole report. Same thing here on thyroid cancer, very rare cancer. Looks like it would be more common in a small group of women in one particular area, clearly identifiable, measured, measurable as pretty model in that And that's what they're doing there. Absolutely disgraceful coverage uh, from and really manipulative and misleading coverage. So, what's the very impressive work? But we've seen this use of relative risk rules on trying to manipulate the, the director of consumer advertising of drugs, the setting, the friendly setting. <laughs> no, something like this, you know, Lipitor, uh, particular slightly reduces your risk of heart that by 36%. If you've got a good eyesight, you can see the small print down here, which says that it means it goes down from 3% to 2%. Over the five years. 100 people have to take it for five years with all the possible side effects, but they don't want it. They don't say that. They say 36%, that sounds great. So, um, I know I went to my GP and asked him what I. Disease, my chance was as a heart attack or stroke, and he put, he just said he would reduce the risk by about a third. Okay, so he told me that um, uh, it's about 12% over the next 10 years. I said, actually, because there's one of me in chance, I'm going to have a dreamless talk. <laughs> so I'm willing to take the one of me in risk. <laughs> You're not in risk, of course. By the way, I'm not going to take those in chance. And so, and then that, so there's, you can think of look, out of 100 people like me, 12 deaths with uh, you know, 12 heart attacks or strokes in 10 years, so I don't get the statin. But if all those people do take their statins, then four of those would be preventative. So that's the benefit. If all of those people have to take a statin in 10 years to prevent four heart attacks or strokes. That's what I want to say. So there's a 1 in 25 for none of these treats, 25 in that point. And those sorts of communications um, generally make people think, you know, well, I'm going to pop off. So you know, the advert makes one click says it, this and we have we got a new cardiovascular risk calculator that's going into all and um, it should be going into protocols, general practices, that will be using a multiplicity of different um, uh, communication messages, and none of them will use relative risks. Now, well, I'd like to choose to get off the side of metaphor and storytelling. That, that metaphor is the metaphor of 100 people like me. But there aren't 100 people like me. And people, and then it would be anecdotally, I mean, quite easy to say, oh, I'm not one of the green ones. You know, people like me too. So we could change the metaphor. Instead of saying 100 people like me, we could say 100 ways things might turn out for you. So not 100 people, different people. It's all you, but there's 100 possible futures. We don't know which one will happen. In which case, the picture would look better like that. So, <laughs> 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 we just don't know which one is like throwing a dart, is it which one's it going to hit? Um, and you can scatter them around, which gives a much better impression of unpredictability. So, my future is like throw your front end set and throw the dart, it comes up yellow, and then it saves me from an off But, I mean, most of the time, what makes a difference are the other one going up. So, that's changing the metaphor of possible futures. And uh, I'd like to show you an example of that. simplistic but useful revision to two ways of thinking about a problem. System one, your gut reaction is going to direct emotional, fast, automatic, heuristic or thinking. Fantastic revision. Really good. System two is, whoa, calm down, let's try to weigh it up, maybe it's just a number of you know, just think about something. And that we we try to use both all the time. And I guess all the what I'm talking about is the fact that we need to be aware of both and uh, then actually what would be great is to try and get people to engage with system two and the So some of the, um, the ideas that they use to come rather quite familiar now in the way of the discipline is like anchoring the fact that you know, people get upset, you tell people a number and then that's everything else is pulled to that number and you're unable to shift the 
way. So, for example, um, one of the examples we would give shows how bad in this, in fact, this communication was the swine flu epidemic. You will remember that a couple of years ago when Liam Donaldson <laughs> did a press conference and for some reason he emphasized this worst case scenario of 63,000 deaths. 65,000 deaths. Ludicrously <laughs> worst case. The models, this is not a plausible thing. It's ludicrously too much. It's all the press picked up. Up to 65,000 people who try to punish this. So they didn't construct the best case, likely. It was all the sex that they were going to build on the back. So I'd like to show you how to prevent that kind of disease to the patient. But just to show an example again of anchoring, the National Hurricane Center of the US in 2005 used this idea for communicating this to the So it's the code of uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> That's the white bit. It's two to one chance the hurricane will go through there rather than this. So white means two to six to six percent. And then they put in the best, whoop, the best um, gets that was like. And what they found is that people who lived, people who lived in the back, just to the right of the path, the black one, thought, oh, I'll be right, didn't go back to make the house got flat. Complained about it. They all well, I wasn't in the back one. Well, no, you know, that black line could get anywhere. So, and then what, so there's a lot of complaints about the black line. And so the doctor, you take that one because we don't anchor them too much for the six to the one. Now there's no black line. Just the cone. And I, I sort of, I don't think that's great. And, and what happened in the last, this is what I read in 2011, is that the media started using an alternative representation based on what they call possible, possible, future, possible cards. It's spaghetti card based on multiple computer cards in where the current tornado might go, where the current tornado might go. So that's the possible futures method. It's like very much like showing Monte Carlo, actually showing the results of Monte Carlo simulation to people and saying, well, we don't know what's going to happen, but it could be one of these. And here's our sort of sketching. Very powerful. I mean, as well as simulators, which is it's so familiar, so obvious. But to use the actual the raw anchor to communicate to people, use a possible, great possible future. And it's very powerful. I'm sure people can use that in practice to try to communicate to be a set of uncertainty. But this went straight into the routine practice, straight into the routine people without any psychological testing. I think it's good. People like this, I should really think it's quite a good way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I like it very much. And very good. And the Bank of England, do people really like bank charts? <laughs> and Bank have been doing this for years, but they didn't want to know. But, um, uh, uh, what's the name? Merlin King really liked them. And there they produce a, uh, these are these fans, that the actual one is 90%, and then the next one is 87%. <laughs> For the growth and, and uh, inflation over the next few years. And yeah. Notice one thing there's no black line. Yeah, they do not give the best estimate because the newspapers don't say bank will say well, the inflation will increase. No black line. There's black line in the past, the ONS data. But you know, what's quite interesting there is they see, okay, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, as we don't know what's happening at the moment, and we certainly don't know what's happening in the past. So they're quite honest about this, the way that it's a very, very short sort of see. So that's good. That's good. Um, that's what actually happened. That's what actually happened. It was a bit of a That's what actually happened. And um, I showed that side of the That was we do that with the bank. We do that with the bank. I showed it for the road. It came in complete lack of all any shame or apology whatsoever. And there is right in the way. Because in the small part of the graph, in the small part, it's made reasonably clear that 5% of probabilities are unassigned at the bottom. These are 90% of the people, five at the top and five at the bottom, you could be idiot. So, you know, they, you know, bets are off. If it goes down here, it could be idiot. So this is fine. You know, five is not so. It's not very clear in the graphic. I think they should have dragons or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> One in 20 chance, your guess is good as mine. It's really what they're saying. <coughs> In order to, I mean, that's deliberate to encourage resilience of banks and shops, like swans, and crazy. Deliberate effort. And the way we, I'm jumping slightly to what I'm going to get onto is the deeper uncertainty. I mean, there's bits you make you can't model, but yet you want to warn people that you can't model. I don't think they did the warning very well. Um, at the moment, you start with their fan charts, which says in reasonably large print that this assumes the euro doesn't collapse. It does. Your guess is good. So they, they, these are contingent projections, and there's bits they 
something they like, would be great because it's exactly what the site wants for literature, suggested they should like are things like this. Um, and frequency trees. No use of polynomials if a child has no relative progressive stem cells. All in terms of polynomials, what would well, we expect to happen in 200 years? 200 women like you have grown to the screen in 20 years, and they tend to be 15 to the school about breast cancer because the screen doesn't stop for breast cancer. 12, amazingly, you know, 80%, um, uh, yeah, 80% will be treated as well. Uh, the breast cancer is actually cured, essentially. Uh, <coughs> very good stuff. So, um, incredibly good stuff. But sadly, three was sort of high conversion of their breast cancer. Now, one of the 200 women don't go for screen, so I'm not going to go for screen. This is what is expected to happen. The same number of developed breast cancer, and eight will be treated and survive, but four will die early from their breast cancer. So, one extra death of 200 will be treated and survive. However, three of these women will never know they've got breast cancer. They will be so clinical, they won't know they've got it, they'll die of something else without ever having. Treatment or consider themselves a victim of this. So these, essentially, there's three called overdiagnoses and overtreatments. Don't know who they are, we've got distinguished yet the ones that the, the cancers that will grow and the ones that just sit there and not die, unfortunately. So what that means is the trade-off is that if you go to screening, one could have three more treatments. This corresponds to 4,000 women at the moment each year in the country being treated unnecessarily with cancer. And 1,300 women whose early deaths are preventable. So, what do you do? So that's now that's in the league. And the numbers are in the league. But sadly, and I was a bit grumpy about that, the picture isn't in the league. They're taken out of the last trial. So I was, there were certain words spoken at that point, but never mind, I had to give in. And um, among the big committee, because they, they tried it on some people, and so I don't understand what they did. And this is I'd like to write this a bit about communication, because I know that I've explained this many more and people will grasp it if you've got a chance to show it. Uh, but you know, just seeing an old piece of paper is quite tricky. Um, there are other ways to communicate this what happens in breast cancer screening, but because rather than to change your feelings about it, I would if I wanted to give you a negative aspect of it, a negative frame of the breast cancer screening, I could. So here's a negative frame just to show that people use it as good. Of survivors of breast cancer family screening, how many owe their lives to the screen? The very common story is celebrities say, Oh, I've served on the screen of my family breast cancer. It saved my life. I hope you should So, what we know that out of 200 women, 12 will have their breast cancer family screen <coughs> and survive, but it's not survive. So, these are people who would say, Oh, I went for screening, I don't have a But in fact, we know by comparing with 200 other women that eight of those would survive anyway, the breast cancer. Three of them would never be treated, and one goes a lot of There's actually 8%, so 92% of people who you think that their lives are going to say that it's going to be So that's a very negative, that, that does not appear in the <laughs> That's a very negative effect. And this is the way the anti screeners uh, pose the argument. So this is what appears in the anti screeners. So it's going to frame, it's the same numbers can be framed in very different um, But going back onto the numeracy thing, I don't know if you're about this, because, you know, the leaflet's written for only a, a reading age of 11, but the numeracy is only even less. And the leaflet's are optimized about the people below numeracy. So they can understand. So they get one stuff that's taken out. However, there's reasonable research showing that low numeracy people avoid the idea of, of shared care and informed decision making. To do, which is fair, fair enough. Everyone's got the right to do that. But that means that the leaflets are designed for people who don't want leaflets. And that's the merit. Apparently, leaflets are designed for people who don't want leaflets. People who do want leaflets, don't get it because it's not fair. But it's really true. Now, people have started to recognize this. Some very good papers now coming out saying we've got to have multi layered communication materials. So, what is available <laughs> corresponds to what they want and what they need. And then you need supplementary fact sheets, you need hyperlinks on that. One size does not fit all. People are being ill served by trying to crowd over them into a POM format and using just those POM denominators. So I think this is the interesting area that all this stuff's going on. That um, you can't say this is the right way to do it. No, people are so different, varied, and their needs and demands. No right way to make for any of this system. There are some ones that are wrong for everybody. So that's okay. So let's go back to the 
the um, gold coin first. What can we do about that? Um, yeah, the way in which risks are communicated about our behaviour is in terms of um, hazard ratios. Uh, so if you, you know, look at the epidemiological literature, you'll find out that two hours watching television increases your annual risk of death by 90%. And eating a sausage, about 10 uh, the, the, yeah, the first 20 minutes getting off, off, off the sofa, um, is 18, 81 says there's 90% reduction in your annual risk of death. It has from doing those two days. So that's stuff in logical stuff. Does anyone understand this? What does it mean to anybody? Well, not very much. Because you know, when you get stories like this on the Red Meat, <laughs> the Daily Express, how do they report these stories, these relative risks? They say, well, if people cut down the amount of red meat they eat, Ten percent of all deaths could be avoided. The statistics one as a statistician, you need to read this bang your head against the wall. Thank you. 
that says that, well, my good life may you know, cycling reduces your risk by um, your annual risk of death by 20%. <coughs> in the newspapers recently, you'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's about like taking two years off my age. That's not good. So you do it in the head, you do it in the head really easily. Great. So what that means then um, is that, for example, you know, the two hours watching television for two year on your own. Dave sausage one year, so see you have a take, eating your sausage. And then they can do it if you don't buy fruit and veg a day, you know, if you do this, they can call yourself your own. And then if you get off your backside and move around a bit, which is the government rec- guidelines, 20 minutes of moderate exercise a day. And two years off your own. The next 40 minutes doesn't do so much at all. So you can't avoid it. Big male, big male has four years to your age essentially, because every male has got the risk, same kind of risk of dying as a female, four years old. And then that holds all the way through. And of course, these are, not, these are related because that's probably because they're sitting watching television and eating sausage. They're being slow. So um, that, that is there. Don't feel sorry. So basically, what this chat says is how old is your body? And I'm not the first one. Do people know these websites? They haven't tried it. <laughs> My sister's obsessed with these. <laughs> there's hundreds of these sites. You go in there, you put in all your factors, and it tells you how old you really are. <laughs> so this lady is uh, my age, 60, but she so read me a lot of chest stress, and she's put seven years on her age. Then they try to sell you something. <laughs> <laughs> they're all trying to sell you tablets or therapy or something like that. But, and so this is used commercially. I think it's a I think I think it's a really good communication. Very good. And it's being used already. And our risk calculator tells you your heart age, how old your heart is. <coughs> so you may be 50, but if you're smoking, your heart may be 58. In lung age, telling smokers how old their lungs are has been shown to be an effective way of getting the smoke. So this raises the balance of stuff. It's a very powerful matter to how old you really are. And so uh, it's something that we hope we can see more. Um, yeah, but Essentially, you know, your age being one year old, uh, it's quite bad to say it's taking a year off your life. But if you just say, oh, this will take a year off your life, people just think, oh, you know, it's just another year less being old and driven here. I don't care about that. Yeah. Kings of the Angus said, I'm not going to give anything up. We'll save it another year and then nursing the rest of the super. So, um, but then we think about, okay, what is taking a year? Here's another method. <laughs> another, yeah, another, another. A year off your life for young people. Yeah, they're asking you. So young people have so about 50 years left in 50, 60 years in their adult life. You're in your 20s or something. 50, 60 years out of um, So a year off that is like about 2% of the So pro rata, that's about a week every year. Or half an hour a day. So you could say using a young person, how many habits a year off their life? Is going to is equivalent to taking 30 minutes off your life expectancy of each day. What you don't have for two hours is half an hour of your life. That is not like that's a really direct because it's like the sausage, not half an hour. So we call this a micro life. <laughs> this comes back. So the micro more. Micro more is one million chance of dropping dead bang, like that. A micro life is near. And why is it being for life? Turns out, it's a million and a half hours is 57 years. So you young people in the audience, you've got a million and a half hours. <laughs> you've wasted two, listening to me. <laughs> 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 so, never to be gone. Your original son got the six gone. That's like this. Frittering these things away. <laughs> a million. Just, and you're not stopping a million. So, you can get some my watches now. So you can, they, so you can think of by your habits, on average, if you're, if these habits make you probably one year older, or essentially you take an half an hour for life. Okay, boom. So the boom. So that's what I'm doing. And the booze, now the booze is interesting, because I'm looking forward to my first drink. I should stick at one drink, because um, the evidence seems to be really the, the, one of the first drink each day is stage of fusion life life medicine, fusion life life half an hour on your life. Unfortunately, for people like me, it 
then goes poison, 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 you lose it. And roughly about 15 minutes of the you. So well, you have time for three units, and you want units quite small. You're about to quit, and that's the right thing. Consumption, and then you're about to quit, and then it's farming, 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 all the way. So by the time you've got a few cans, you're losing your heart back. So, right, you know, pro rata is 15 minutes of life. So 20 cigarettes a day, uh, it's five hours a day you're losing, so you're going towards your death for 29 hours a day. And, and this last one, this last one really, you might want to look away at this one. How to warn school kids. This is not for the those who are nervous to see. The sadly is maybe in five kilograms overweight. And the latest value analysis is this. Every five kilograms you are overweight. Because it has the ratio about 1.09 again. The Downton Abbey, the sausage, the, um, um, the, drink, the, the drinks, the public cigarettes, the half an hour. So these are you know, they're metaphors. We publish this stuff, um, but you'll see a bit of it. Oh, yeah, this is some orange shit. Some more of this. You're an airport scout, and they would live longer than your friend. Great, who are you going to talk to? Oh, yeah, I've got a few minutes. All right. A few more minutes? No, Mike? Okay. A few more minutes. Let's just go on to the final step. Um, now, so far, I've been assuming that we know all the numbers. And, and actually, we don't, because this yet to be on the block, right? Wait for a lot of the other things. So, the problem to remember is deeper uncertainty. And how different groups have tried to deal with the fact that when science isn't understood. For example, IPCC and climate change, um, they, they've been desperately trying to impose some uh, discipline of uncertainty, of communication of uncertainty on their powers. And one thing they firstly positioned is that if you use words like very likely, they would have mean something. So very likely means 90 to 100 percent. Extremely likely means 95 percent because the, uh, the latest assessment, the um, uh, belief that we have caused such a global warming to go up from 90 to 95 percent. Very extremely likely. Um, but what they say is that you should only be using those expressions of probability in situations of what we call high confidence. So this is what we want to get onto this idea of a star rating of your model. <laughs> so they are only willing to put probabilities on things when they're confident about the science of their model. And whatever you think about climate models, definitely some are better than others, some areas are better than others. And they will they will only put probabilities on their natural models. Good scientific evidence, five main things, is that can actually work you know, agreement between experts and models about what's, what's going to happen. And otherwise, they're not willing to put those probabilities on. <laughs> So they've got these two, they've got two elements, which are actual likelihood scale, the risk scale, and another scale which says, actually, do we believe what, do we know what we're talking about? And it's this one that I find interesting. And um, a number of different agencies, and intelligence, and others, have been trying to work towards this. It's a star rating on um, how well they understand the phenomenon they're trying to make. Uh, in particular, I just made a few points here. <laughs> Talking to people in the MOD who are doing intelligence estimates and terrorism, the thing that makes their, uh, their intelligence estimates <laughs> most unhappy about their whole analysis, their risk analysis, is if they know there's a bit of information that they could have but they haven't got yet. In other words, in the state of ignorance. <laughs> so the uncertainty is to do with the knowledge, not to do with the essential unpredictability. That's what epistemic uncertainty is. And, but if there's something, well, if only we had this, we'd really go with a lot, it makes you very uncomfortable about giving a risk assessment to how likely it is. Because if you feel you've got all the information you could possibly have, then it's interesting, well, I've got to make some judgment. So that's an interesting sort of psychological finding, which I think is very reasonable. And rare people, due to the inadequacy of information to have, are unwilling to be confident about the analysis. So we've been developing this <coughs> people in a judge business school. A sort of rough sort of Star ages of scale four different models. So if you think of a model as comprising a number of things, you've got one thing the model is what might happen in events, and then you've got your parameters, the numbers we go into the model, and then you've got the structure of the model, the actual you know, scientific understanding of how the model works, and then of course you've got values and losses, you know, which you made up about you know, what's important, what you've chosen to model. And, and I, I find this one useful when I'm looking at it, it sort of tells me about some of the risk analysis they're doing. So, okay, what are they doing with their uncertainty? Are they denying it? Are they just saying, ah, we know exactly what will happen? And 
uh, that's fairly rare that can happen, but it's certainly <laughs> real that it can be. The other one is when you're, you're very confident, you're confident about what probably the distribution's in. You feel, yep, this is my, I know, it's like, you know, flipping a coin. You really you know, know what's going on. You have your hope for 50-50, you know, you really know what's, it's, it's fantastic. You can't predict what's going to happen, but you really know what's going to happen. The next one, and there's a big gap in between these two because you've got all sorts of ideas of what we might better put intervals and probabilities we might do all sorts of things. And the next one is where you could actually say we're going to talk about possibilities with lists on. And of course, this doesn't apply for whole models because in climate change, for example, they will model some things um, with some detail, but then say in terms of <coughs> scenarios, we can only do lists. So this is a deterministic sensitivity analysis to different assumptions. It's just possibility to do Then, and that's standard. Then I think we're going to do the interesting bit. The interesting bit is where people then are, are prepared to have the humility to admit that their models are inadequate. And that's where I feel that there's a lack of language to do this. So one of the things we're going to do is specify the narrative when you know you're very aware of the limitations of what you've done. And we don't know how to model certain things. There are other possible inputs. We know our models are left out certain factors. We know. We actually listen. We don't know how to model this. And we know our models are now. Okay? And that's the humility to, to admit that. And then, of course, your final thing, which is when you don't even know what you've left out, you know, you, you know there's aspects that you just feel uncomfortable about it because there's stuff that isn't in there, but you don't even, you don't even list what it is that you that you left out. Unspecified analysis. So it's acknowledge of real ignorance. And that's in the situation that the Bank of England are doing, where it's just saying, be ready for surprises. We're not even going to model this, we could list the possible inadequacies, like the Euro collapse, which is an example of the specified inadequacies, because they're actually listing the possible things that we haven't put in the model, but they also say we should have general experience the things we haven't even thought of. The back of England was struggling, it's not communicating very well. So uh, it's funny, it's just a mixture of psychology and modeling, but it's non quantitative things to do with the inadequacies. So, I find this really quite useful. Then of course you go full circle, because this is acknowledged ignorance. And if you go to full circle and you're denied of anything, you're certain that's meta ignorance, because you don't know that you're all <laughs> So the top one is you actually get a, a nice circle. Okay, so um, the one element of area where this could be applied was in crises. For example, um, the killer cucumbers. Remember the killer cucumbers? <laughs> the great in Germany. And the, the, the typical is the Spanish Minister of Agriculture <laughs> <laughs> stuffing herself for all she can with organic cucumbers to show how safe they were. And because they, but they did find E. coli in the cucumber. It was actually the wrong E. coli. It wasn't the one that was killing them. Cucumbers were completely pissed. It's like 100 million euro lost, and they're still, the Spanish are still trying to get it back. <laughs> because they didn't think that the lab didn't think all the uncertainty, they said, oh, we found it. They haven't found it. They found these striking Egyptian pedigrees. So that was an example of bad you know, lack of humility. So um, John Krebs is fantastic on this. Now, I'll just, I'm going to go on a bit too much, so I'll just put this up quickly. John Krebs, who is a food standards agency, had a real sort of process of dealing with crises, which you have to do with lots of additives and for America and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and he was really emphasizing the ecology of uncertainty, being really open about the uncertainty. And not just risk about probability, but we don't know what the risks are. We don't know what the risks are. But always emphasizing the contingency that we are learning all the time and we may adapt and we'll find out more and come back to you. And this is what you can do in the meantime. And we're confident about what we're telling you to do. You know, you can be cautious. Now, I mean, he said, oh, well, maybe we don't think there's a problem with the, with the land, but if you don't really need to, don't need to. We'll come back to you. You know, he didn't say, oh, it's safe. He never says anything safe. Unlike the classic example where we can do things it's safe, oh, I don't want to be society. Um, okay, I'll come to that bit. I'm nearly finished. Now, so, the last slide. So, well, as a summary of my talk, really, I garble, you know, very good. What I'm struggling with, what the book is about as well, is about the fact there's two ways of thinking about all these things. System two, using the brain, being rational, hate that word rational, because we're not done as a nation. You know, weighing things up. And system one, which is using your guts, guts, <laughs> <laughs> relying on feelings, emotion, culture, and culture, emotion, and human intuition. And the point is, it's not like it's a choice between these. We, the human, are a mixture of all of 
And so the point is to try and combine them in the most efficient way as possible, you know, maybe sort of halfway between. So that's the, the essence of the talk. But what I wanted to finish off with, sorry about it so long, was the um, example of open confidence in a crisis. Which many of you can remember this. You know, John Gunner force feeding his four year old daughter Cordelia a British beef burger. So British beef is safe. Um, yeah, well, it wasn't actually. It was the, we think she's okay now. <laughs> they did a few, you know, there were banks in Turkey and destroyed it as a capital. But the interesting thing I wanted to point out is that modern forensic photographic analysis reveals the important fact that this is not the bike mark of a four year old. <laughs> Example, so I cycled down on a bar spot. There's no apartment 
<laughs> no, I, I use this quite a lot, and I've been writing a bit about it on more or less and things like that because the. No, I'm citing Levels Risky. And we've just done an analysis which we're publishing on the six deaths in two weeks. And um, yeah, no, interesting because there's. You have to use this idea. I mean, the, the rate at the moment is 0.6 deaths for two weeks. So it is a Poisson distribution for the last eight years, fits the Poisson almost exactly. But this cluster, six in two weeks, um, you know, there's something way in the tail of a Poisson that mean 0.6. But the point is you have to think over those eight years, you, you know, in any moving two-week window, what's the chance of getting actually that's the whole thing of scan statistics. But actually the, the approximations to do that are quite simple to probe them in. And it works out that over eight years, um, to get six deaths in any two-week moving window, there's only a two and a half percent chance. So it was, it really was a cluster. Not, you know, mostly these clusters turn out to be, oh, you expect it to be quite long. It really was a cluster. I can't think of what was in common with them, but it really was very surprising. That it's about 62 years. So anyway, anyway, I mean, the of London, I think, should be very careful indeed. Um, but they, I mean, sort of basically, as a cyclist in London, I, I feel we've just got to improve the infrastructure. It's, just, right. it's a disgrace expecting people to do it when the infrastructure is so bad and so dangerous. Um, and. Uh, so I, I think you've got to think so because people point to you know the numbers are increasing and this whole thing of safety in numbers speeds and all is is controversial so, you know people say that in Holland and in Denmark there's lots of cyclists and there's a very low fatality rate but they also have much better facilities structure for them. you can't expect safety in numbers to work on its own. So distance per, per, 
the, the, the feeling of being in a passenger deck. I mean, all the, all the acts from this is just in the 15 minutes of the And essentially. Then, per minute, the risk is, you know, it's about, I think, the same as, as such. <coughs> At the time when you are most nervous than anything, no, it's the same as if you're cycling. So, there's some reason to be nervous about it. Entirely deluded. <laughs> Surely, it's going to be more dangerous to cycle across the Atlantic. Yeah, yes, yes. It's a mile, that's what I'm saying. Given the acknowledged complexities of, of human behaviour, we've touched on a number of them, such as those, those with lower education tend to shy away from things that communicate in numbers and long words and so on, and those with higher education tend to believe their own rhetoric rather than taking <laughs> yeah, uh, with all you. Yeah. How much do you think that, in terms of the, the balance of the challenge here, we can't ever communicate our way out of this problem, yeah. we can only do it through educating and getting people with a better position on Absolutely, absolutely. If you think that presenting things in transparent communication is going to make people say, ah, oh, thank you very much, I'm now become a rational person. <laughs> absolute nonsense. This stuff has almost no effect on behaviour at all. And you know, like, endless trials have shown that really good communication numbers. I, I bet these cancer screening meetings don't influence behaviour at all. That you, so what, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? I think firstly there's an ethical duty to do it. Because you're if you don't provide transparent information, the only thing people have got is a turn to respond to a completely terrorist attitude, or to this all the nonsense that we get from the news. So I think it is a duty to provide transparent information, even if it's ignored as it far as it is. The other thing is, hugely, is, is about improving education. And we, it looks like it might be moving a bit more in that direction, so that people are able to critique and deconstruct the numbers they hear in the news and don't be so manipulated. But my basic interest in this, many people have said that, that you know, everyone's gut feelings are just fine. But where you have engaged this sort of rash, something more rational thing is when people, people are trying to manipulate. They're trying to sell your opinions and your products and things like that in newspapers. And so you have to say, no, oh, hang on, hang on, but you know, this one thing has happened. What about a million times it hasn't happened? That kind of stuff. So the psychologists, I, there's some psychologists I think who really hit the nail on it. What they, they say, what they're trying to do with good communication isn't to change behavior, they're really understanding. Or, well, how they measure the effect is that they're trying to breed immunity to misleading anecdote. And they can, you can do an experiment on that. Because you, you, you randomize your audience. You do one half um, you know, rubbish communication, the other half good transparent communication using iPod arrays, you do nice long numbers, really clear. And then you randomize again and give half of you um, representative stories about an operation, about what happens to most people. And the other half, ludicrously extreme stories. Like, well, I, I heard this happen to some people. And then you look at what people's opinions are. Really. And the people who have been given the good representation are less influenced by the bad stories. And it's simply, yes, yes, that's what you have to do. Try to reduce the impact of misleading stuff. Yes. So I thought that was really good. As you know, what's what you're trying to do? Well, I think we have to draw up the clues there. It's going to see about a long time. Can we